good evening. My name is Gina DuVernay, and I'm the Adult Services Manager for Gwinnett County Public Library. Hello. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I, I hope you all weren't waiting too long. The doors are locked at this hour, but hopefully you were able to get in. No problem. Um, yes, please, let me direct your attention to Bookworm Bookstore here on the side. Thank you for coming, Julia. Thank you so much. <laughs> She's got all the beautiful books that have all the beautiful covers there. So please browse and, and purchase all the copies you want um, for your library like I do for mine, uh, my personal library. I can't get enough. But anyway, um, so we also have delectables in the back. Now, there are quite a few. Please don't make me take them. You know at midnight you're going to wish you took it. So I just do my, myself, do me a favor, do yourself a favor, OK? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you because you don't have anything. Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and start and read their bios and then we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to start with our moderator. New York Times bestselling author Tiari Jones is the author of four novels, most recently An American Marriage. Published in 2018, An American Marriage is in Oprah's book club selection and also appeared on Barack Obama's summer reading list. The novel was awarded an NAACP Image Award and has been published in two dozen countries. Her third novel, Silver Sparrow, was added to the NEA Big Read Library of Classics in 2016. Jones is a graduate of Spelman College, University of Iowa, and Arizona State University. She is an Andrew D. White Professor at Large at Cornell University and the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Creative Writing at Emory University. Now, our featured author of the evening, Wanda M. Morris, is the acclaimed author of All Her Little Secrets, which was named as one of the best books of 2021 by Hudson Booksellers and selected as the number one top pick for library reads by librarians across the country. It has been optioned for a one hour limited series on Showtime. Her book, Anywhere You Run, was named one of the top 10 crime fiction books for 2022 by the New York Times. It was also selected as one of the best books of 2022 by NPR, Publishers Weekly, Amazon, and Library Journal. It has been named as one of the 15 standout historical fiction books to read this year by Oprah Daly. Wanda is a member of Sisters in Crime, Crime Writers of Color, and serves on the board of the International Thrillers, Thriller Writers. She is married and is a mother of three and lives in Atlanta, Georgia. Wanda's upcoming book, What You Leave Behind, will be out in June. That already sounds scary. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let's give it a round of applause. Well, we want to thank you all for coming here on a Saturday night. And I will say that people who come to book events on Saturday nights are my kind of people. <laughs> I am very excited to talk to Wanda Morris about um, both her books, but mostly her most recent book, Anywhere You Run. I keep wanting to call it Wherever You Run, Anywhere You Run. How many people have read it already? How many people have not read it but know about it? How many people is this your first introduction to Wanda and her work? Excellent. As a writer, one thing I always say whenever there's an audience that says, oh, I haven't read your book or I haven't heard of your book, it is actually a cause of celebration because it means you are widening your audience today. So at the, you'll go to bed tonight with more fans and readers than you had when you woke up this morning. Let's talk about Anywhere You Run. It, was re, it received an award for Best Historical Fiction, and also you're on the board of the Crime Fiction and Organizations for Writers Who Write Crime Fiction. How would you describe this book? I describe Anywhere You Run as a coming-of-age story of two young black girls growing up in the Jim Crow South of 1964 um, with a few dead bodies thrown in. So um, I, I do write uh, crime fiction. That's kind of my jam. Um, and the reason why I do that, I think, is because I am always trying to find the humanity in um, those depraved conditions that we sometimes live under. Um, the world is a complicated place, 
And um, I think I'm always trying to find the decency and humor and um, all those good things in spite of all the bad things that we face in the world. So um, specifically, Anywhere You Run is the story of Marigold and Violet. They're two sisters, um, 21, 22 years old. And um, Violet is um, kind of a sassy young lady. And she, um, is, she suffers a brutal attack, essentially. And uh, she knows that, you know, because of her, the nature of her personality, she exacts revenge on her attacker. But she knows growing up in Jim Crow, Mississippi, that um, a black woman who kills a white man is not going to find justice, despite the circumstances. So she takes off running. Um, when uh, the police show up at her sister's door looking for her, her sister is in a bit of trouble as well because she's unwed and she's pregnant, which is a no-no for good girls in the 1960s. So with the police at her door, her own situation kind of waffling, she takes off running too, and she heads north. But what the two women don't realize is that there's a very dangerous man who is hot on their trail, and he has some very dark secrets of his own as well. <laughs> I, for one, love stories about sisters, especially sisters with very different personalities. Mm -hmm. Because the sister who's pregnant is the last one you would think would be the one who's pregnant, right? Yeah. And the one who commits the murder, it's not exactly a shock. Like, well, I won't say, I won't say you would have thought she was a murderer, but if you thought someone in this family is going to exact a, act of retro, a murderous act of retribution, you would know which one it would be, correct? <laughs> and she heads off and she tricks the guy who gave her the ride. Can, can we spoil that part just a little bit? So the book opens up um, with, um, you know, I, I don't do a lot of gore in my books, even though I do crime fiction. I don't do a lot of that stuff on the page. So. Um, Violet, who is the sister, um, she has already exacted her revenge on um, her attacker. Um, she has come up with a plan. She's devised a plan for how to get out of town. Um, and what she has done is she has kind of uh, mesmerized uh, a young man by the name of Dewey. Um, and she leads him to believe that she is in love with him. Now, he is white. Again, we're talking Jim Crow South, 1964. He is white and he is enthralled with her because she's very beautiful and she has this, you know, uh, very big personality. Um, and so she tells him that, yeah, she will run off with him to get married. They're headed to Boston. Um, but in fact, they don't quite make it there together. Um, they are driving, they land in Birmingham, Alabama, and she decides that's about far enough uh, with Dewey. And so she takes off running from there and she leaves Dewey high and dry. Um, she but, takes off on a bus. <laughs> on a bus. On a bus. She has some, you underselling this scene. <laughs> <laughs> she has him. They go like to a gas station or something that's conveniently across the street from the bus station. And she's like, I'll be right back, baby. <laughs> it gets on the bus. Yes. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but she's smart. She's smart. She's yeah, that's tenacious. A smart plan. Yeah, yeah. And she has put this plan together long before they ever left Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and so things um, go as planned until um, she winds up in a small town. Um, she winds up getting off the bus in a small town called Chillicothe. And if any of you have read my first book, you'll recognize that town. So that's a little Easter egg. Um, but yeah, she winds up in a small town and that's where things kind of take a turn. Tell us a little bit about the relationship between the sisters. It is a really, deep um, and affecting relationship. 
um, the sisters love each other, but like, you know, siblings, they have their moments too. Um, but I think it is because they are so committed and so, and the other thing about the book, the two sisters are kind of alone in the world. They've lost their parents. Um, and so all they have is each other. So when they both take off running, um, they realize I, I don't have my other half. And um, so, in fact, you have, you know, the two sisters running away from something, but they're also trying to find one another as well, and they never really lose that bond. Um, and so I, I like sibling relationships in books. Um, like you, I, I love exploring relationships. My first book explored a brother-sister relationship because there's something about family, you know? Family, you're connected by blood, but you're also distinct personalities and people too. And so, you know, you have your moments. Um, but these two sisters find each other um, in ways, and I don't mean just physically, but they find each other kind of emotionally and they're there for each other and, you know, there to lift each other up, despite their very distinct personalities. And somebody's stalking them. And somebody's stalking them. Yes. And he's got some issues of his own as well. As stalkers do. <laughs> as stalkers do. That's right. <laughs> I really, um, and then I love the way that this story is mired in a particular moment in history. Mm -hmm. Would you like to read, to give us a short reading from the book? Sure. So um, this is the opening passage from the book. Um, like I said, it's the summer of 64, and um, this was also the summer of the Summer Freedom Project, where um, college students were recruited to come down um, north, uh, from the north down south uh, to help black Mississippians um, file applications to get the right to vote. And uh, many of you probably learned about uh, Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner. Um, they were, you know, three young men who were part of the Summer Freedom Project, and they lost their lives, sadly. Um, they were murdered. And um, this murder is kind of intertwined into the book. Now, I have an author's note that I always read because sometimes the language that I use in the book, um, you know, it's raw. And so I read the author's note, and then I read the passage. This book contains certain terms that I would never use or condone. However, as the story takes place in the deep south of 1964, I wanted to lend as much authenticity as possible to the dialogue and narration. Sadly, such terminology was prevalent at that time. Neshoba County, Mississippi, June 21, 1964. All four men passed around a bottle of Jim Beam as they peeled up State Route 19, giddy with excitement about what they'd do once they hogtied those coons and got them to a tree. The engine revved as they hit the crest of the road doing 80 miles per hour. Getting pulled over was the least of their concerns because Olin's cousin, Sheriff Bickford, was riding shotgun. Bickford had gotten a tip and rounded up the other three to head from Jackson over to Meridian and then north to Neshoba County. Olin, sitting in the back seat, threw back a swig and passed the bottle on, assuring the others they were doing God's work. The last thing anybody needs is for them to start voting. Bad enough the goddamn government wants us to let them eat in our restaurants and sit beside us on a bus. If the Lord had meant for whites to mix with coloreds, he would have made the coloreds a hell of a lot smarter. Either we stay all white or we die amongst them. A couple of the other men nodded in silent agreement. Bickford had explained to the others that his buddy and the Shelba County Sheriff tipped him off that they'd landed a few of those troublemaking civil rights activists from up north. They'd made arrangements. The plan was to arrest the men and hold them for a few hours. After nightfall, they'd release the men, tell them to be out of the county before midnight. Fifteen minutes later, the men would find themselves caught in a speed trap out on Rock Cut Road. Bickford's friend told him he could get a piece of the action if he made it up in time. A few minutes later, the car slowed to a crawl. 
I think this is it, Bigford said. They all went quiet as the car eased up to the edge of a band of trees. Bigford spotted Smite Goody's truck and pointed. They knew they were in the right place. They cut the engine. All four men sat in the vehicle for a moment, polishing off the bottle. Bigford's low wheeze of excitement, the only sound amongst them. The sweltering summer darkness cloaked them all. Voices, low, some laughing, whispered through the cypress trees. The men piled out of the car. Olin and Bigford unloaded rope and pliers from the trunk before they followed the sound of the voices. By the time they reached the clearing, they found at least six or seven men there, all standing in a semicircle. Someone had parked his car just so and flooded the space with his car beams. The low-lying light cast the men's faces in ghostly angles, their cheekbones and chipped teeth upturned in wicked smiles of accomplishment. Bigford was the first of his little quartet to reach the clearing, Olin right on his tail. The heavy scent of wet earth and male sweat slinked through the small crowd. By the looks of things, Bigford could see the arrangements had changed. The rope and pliers were no longer needed. They were too late. All the other men stood over an open, shallow grave, and lying at the bottom of it, three young men, two white and one Negro. All three had been shot dead, their bodies oddly contorted, their faces grim vestiges of youth and hope extinguished. Bigford eased over to his friend and gathered up the details of how the plan had unfolded. According to his buddy, some folks had gotten impatient. Guns this time instead of rope. The blue Ford station wagon the three men had been riding in would be burned and disposed of over at Bogue Chitto. The other men stood around holding conversations, laughing even, and grabbing a smoke. One man stood at the edge of the circle pointing a brownie camera down into the grave and snapping pictures. There was a new man in their midst because Bigford heard gagging and vomiting against a tree behind him, probably someone who'd never seen a dead body or the way Mississippi handled rabble rousers and nigger lovers. Now, all that was left to do was collect a few souvenirs, an ear, a finger, and head back to Jackson. That is a sobering kind of reminder of history in this novel that, you know, as a thriller, it's the kind of thing that most people think of as kind of, um, an escapist genre, mm -hmm. the way that in thrillers, we tend to almost like escape into the murder. But this, this story, it's really, it's really bracing. Do you mind telling the um, audience a little bit about how this famous historical murder ties in to the story of the sisters? Sure. So um, this murder uh, occurs and um, I don't want to give away too many spoilers because I want you to kind of read the book and gasp when you get to certain parts. But um, the murder of those three men and the very important work they were doing um, intertwines with the sisters. Um, Marigold is um, a, a young woman who longs to go to law school. Um, but because she's lost her parents, they don't have the money, she finds work um, as like a typist, secretary, uh, for the Summer Freedom Project. And um, so she is there working day to day with the people that, what they call testers. And these were the people who were recruited from right there in Mississippi, average, you know, black folks that were recruited to go into the city clerk's office and ask for an application to apply and, and register to vote. Um, and so she was doing that kind of work. And so that's how that ties in. Um, the murder of those three uh, young men also ties into Violet, who is the sister who has exacted revenge in a very unusual way, which is a real big spoiler. So I won't give that part away. This story is set in the 60s, in the early 60s. How did you get to all the details of living in that time? 
So um, I love talking about this because it was so much fun. I um, spent a lot of time downtown at the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American History and Culture, right on Sweet Auburn. And um, once I decided on this topic, I knew that I wanted to write about something that dealt with the Voting Rights Act. We had just come through the 2020 election and there was all this noise about the big lie and election fraud and I thought mm, that might be kind of cool to write about and I couldn't figure out a contemporary angle for the story because I didn't want to kind of recreate what we were all going through um, but I thought how is it that we're sitting here today nearly 60 years later and still grappling with these same issues you know access to uh, the voting polls and um, all the things that, you know, the clinical ways that people are trying to keep um, black and brown folks from, from voting. Um, so once I decided, yeah, I'll go back and look at the Voting Rights Act, I um, went down to the library, kind of told the library, and this is why I love libraries. I walked in and I just kind of told him, I didn't even know how I was going to write the story, but I told him, I want to know about the Voting Rights Act of, of 65 and Megar Evers' work and, and all of that. And he kind of opened up this treasure trove of papers and books. And um, that uh, passage that I read with the three young men in, in the shallow grave, there's actual picture of that. Um, and, and I got to tell you, after I saw that, I kind of, you know, I had to stop writing for a couple days. It, it, it was very sobering. Um, but um, I was able to access tons of information. Um, but not only that, I wanted to make sure that the book spoke to the time, to 1964. So I wanted to make sure that the characters talk like people talked in 1964. The way people talked in 1964 is very different from the way we talk now. Um, and so I read a lot of magazines like Life and um, Old Issues of Time and Jet and um, Ebony, and something I didn't even know about called TAN. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of that, but it was also um, uh, another magazine that was geared to the African-American community. Um, and then one of the things that I did, um, I, I listened to a lot of music from the 60s, and I'm so glad I did. I kind of grew up with um, older brothers and sisters and my, my mother and father, and they loved that whole Motown and 60s kind of music. But I listened to a lot of music from that, that era um, because it also gave me insight to what people were talking about during that time. Um, I read a lot of old newspapers, Pittsburgh Courier, uh, Atlanta Daily World. Um, all of these things so that I could make sure that the dialogue kind of spoke um, authentically to what the characters were doing in the book. The most surprising thing you discovered, um, you know, I was looking up an old Jet magazine because my mama was in a Jet magazine in 1958. Wow. Just her, she was just a very young girl and I wanted to get her that Jet. I found it on eBay. You can find anything on eBay. <laughs> I just did a search for it, and there it was. Somebody was selling it for like five bucks. Can you believe that? But I was shocked that the jet, back in the jet book back in the day, it's so small it can fit in the palm of your hand. Yes. It's like this big. It was like this big. And because I grew up with the five by seven jet book, this thing was so little. You couldn't oh, even. Oh, it was smaller than the. And it didn't have a beauty of the week at the time. The, it had the marriage section, but. Yeah, it was so tiny that I had to have it copied and blown up a little bit. My mama is 81, so she could, so she could read it. And that was, it was, it was the size of, I don't know if your grandmama had the daily word. Your grandmama would send you, yes. when your grandmama wanted you to get right, she'd send you that little daily word. The jet was that size. What was the most, what is the most surprising thing you discovered in your research? Um, I think it has to be, you know, I always knew that, you know, we as African-Americans were suppressed and stepped upon and so forth. 
but just women in general, women couldn't get credit in their name in the 1960s. You had to have your father or an uncle or a husband as a co-signer or he get the credit for you. Things like that where, you know, we were all kind of like underfoot. And yet the Jim Crow South had set up this kind of hierarchical system that made white people, no matter what your caste system was, feel like you were better than blacks. And so the, the character Mercer, who is the, the gentleman following the two sisters, he is from very, very poor, humble beginning, but yet he still felt like he was better. And so it was that uh, us versus them that I saw not only the ramifications on us as a people, but just kind of how it's not so much black and white, but it is economical. And some people, despite whatever their economic status is, would still fight against their own um, economic interests because they were white, because they thought, that's okay, I'm still better than the black person over here, even though I'm eating crumbs. And so, and, and that's part of the reason why I wrote the book too, because I saw so many parallels between um, what was happening in the 2020 election, what currently happens today, and what was happening back in the 60s is still kind of the same thing. It's still this whole system of you're better than, when really we're all kind of in the same boat. How did you figure out in doing your historical research, like what kind of clothes the people wore? Oh, that, I'm glad you asked that. So I went through like old photo albums for my family. And um, interestingly enough, I think it might still be up on my website too. I had pictures that I looked at from old magazines um, because I do, I do do a lot of description of clothing. Um, music and those types of things. Um, and I wanted to make sure too that the people were dressing appropriately for who they were. So Mississippi Citizens Council, the men in that group, you know, these were the so-called, you know, big shots, but they were working hard to keep segregation in place, the straw hats and, you know, their, their suits. Um, but with the women, I looked at old pictures from my own family, from magazines. Um, again, like I said, I think I probably went down this research rabbit hole cause I was having so much fun. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that I researched, I couldn't even use in the book cause the book would be 700 pages. You know what I think I noticed in doing some research, it seems like the more freedom women have in terms of a time and place, the less complicated the undergarments. <laughs> <laughs> like I was researching the 50s and all those girdles and things, this thing snaps onto that thing and all that. And I noticed as, as people got freer, people got freer in ways that you couldn't, in ways that you couldn't see. So by the time you were in the 60s, people had 70s, people let the whole bra go. <laughs> And then, so what does that say about now, yeah, though, that yeah, people I, wearing Spanx yeah, again? I, I know the girdle is back. It is. I think they call that, it Spanx. They call it shapewear. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the girdle. Yeah, the girdle is back. I don't think it's. A, I feel that the underwear is like the canary in the coal mine. The underwear is letting us know that things are going backwards. <laughs> I agree. Ladies, get free. Okay, moving on. Sorry, that was just that was. Men are wearing Spanx. Men are wearing Spanx. That's right. They have men shape wear. Okay, y'all, we got we got to get free. I mean, we're gonna go back to literature, but this is just a little PSA, everybody. I don't think anyone ever wrote a great novel in a girdle. How could you? Bro? Yes, you two, two trust up. But okay, but I digress. I digress. I digress. Now you have a very speaking of people getting free, you have a very interesting life story. Uh, your route to becoming a writer, and one thing I knew that coming here, this would be an audience of grown people, 
And a lot of times people ask me as a writer, what advice do you give to young people? But I feel like young people, they don't even need my advice. They got plenty of time to figure it out. And they but, don't listen anyway. Right. So I, um, I was always a bookish kid, but I never, you know, I wasn't one of those people that was like, at four years old, I want to be a writer. I, I wasn't like that, but I read all the time. I always loved books. Um, but, you know, I kind of grew up where, you know, my folks were like, you go out to college so that you can get a good job and earn some money. And so, you know, writers were considered to be, you know, poor, uh, struggling artists. And so that was never an opportunity that I even considered. But I still love stories. Um, and probably about, gosh, my, my daughter is 30 now. So I remember reading the, this book, um, and, and I won't name the author or the title of the book. And I remember reading that book and closing it and going, wow. I could do a better job than this. Like, you know, like I could write a book that surely if this person could get published, but then I didn't do anything with that. You know, you always meet people and they're like, I've got this story. I've got this book. I should, and, and I was, I was that person. Um, but I didn't do anything with it. And then, um, finally, um, you know, fast forward, I, um, Wrote a scene. I got frustrated at work one day, y'all. I just got frustrated. Went home and wrote the first scene, the very first scene I ever written. Um, and it wound up becoming a very pivotal scene in my very first book. And after I wrote that scene, I was like, oh, this feels good. Like, I should try writing some more. I like this. And so I did, and I thought I was writing a book. But y'all, all I was doing was just writing a bunch of scenes. Like I just had people going off and sitting around like this talking and then they go to another room and they sit somewhere and talk with somebody else. Like it wasn't a book book, but um, I think it got me thinking in terms of books. So then I started taking classes, um, online classes, things like that. Cause I, I had enough wherewithal to know this ain't a book yet. Like. This is just some scenes cobbled together. Um, but then I um, started applying to workshop programs and things like that. And that's where I finally figured out, yeah, maybe I really could do this. And to, to make a long story uh, short, I uh, applied to this mentoring program. It was called Pitch Wars. They no longer have it anymore. It's an online mentoring program. And they pair you up with the published author and um, you work on your manuscript for two or three months. And then at the conclusion, they have an agent showcase. And so agents can come in, look at your first page or so. If they like it, then you send it to them. And if you're going to be traditionally published by a large publishing house, you need an agent. Um, so I got into that program. Um, 20 plus agents said they loved my first page and wanted to see my manuscript. And I was like, oh my gosh. Don't clap, y'all. Don't clap. <laughs> Every single one of them rejected the manuscript. Every single one of them. I was heartbroken. And I had already paid to attend a conference. And I was like, and part of that conference was a pitch fest where I could sit with agents and tell them about my book. And I was like, well, there's probably about three agents left on the planet that haven't seen this manuscript. So I'll just apply to them. And so I went to this conference, sat down in front of this young lady and told her about my book. And she was like, ooh, that sounds good. Send it to me. And she signed me up. And I finally had an agent. So I was like, oh, this is great. I'm going to be published now. And so she said, you know, here's some notes kind of beef this up, do this, and then we'll go out on submission, which means we'll send it out to the publishing houses. She said, you work on this over the holidays and we'll go out in March, 2020. Well, what happened in March, 2020? Oh. Yeah, COVID hit. So the world shut down and she's like, Wanda, I don't even know if we're going to be publishing books or anything. So let's just sit tight. And again, I was heartbroken. <laughs> I was like, I am never going to get this book published. Um, but I sat still. I prayed on it. 
waited on the Lord. And in the intervening time, unfortunately, a lot of things happen. In that intervening time, she said, we'll just kind of sit and find out what happens. Um, during that time, Ahmaud Arbery was murdered. Uh, Black Lives Matter uh, marches began. The world kind of changed. George Floyd was murdered. And finally, she called me up and she said, you know what? The story that you're telling in all her little secrets, that was my first book. She said, I think the world needs to hear this story and I'm going to send it out. And we sent it out and that book went to auction, which means that several publishers wanted to publish the book. So wait on the Lord. <laughs> now you're going <laughs> to Yes. You know, I do think that so many people think it can't happen to them. Like when you hear an encouraging story, sometimes your mind will tell you, well, yeah, but that happened to her. She's, you find whatever thing about her is different than you and say, well, yeah, but she's this and I'm that. But I do believe that stories find their way into the world, the story, that the story wants to be out there. And I do find that when you give the story everything that you have in your heart, that doors will in fact open and you just have to be prepared to walk through that door. I think that um, All Her Little Secrets was the perfect book for the time. And I, one of the many things that I admire about your work is the way that you use the genre of thriller. Like these books are juicy, juicy. <laughs> to talk about bigger topics, but it's done in such a way that it's a pleasurable experience. Like you can do it on your vacation, but cause you know, but you're, but you still are learning things as you read. Is that your technique or is that just your superpower? <laughs> well, that's kind of the way I come to books. I like to pick up a book and learn something from it. Of course, I like to be entertained. You know, you plunk down 20, 30 bucks for a book. Yeah, I want an entertaining story. I want a story that touches me emotionally. But I also love books that teach me something or take me to a different world I've never explored or show me a different perspective on an issue that I've never considered. And so I think because that's the way I like to read, you know, then I write books that way in the hopes that other people will enjoy it too and learn something. And there's so, so much to learn about the world. Um, I tend to use stories from, you know, my experiences as a lawyer, as a sister, a mom, a daughter, um, and try and weave that into my stories as well. And so I tend to have, um, like you say, kind of bigger issues, issues that um, affect ordinary folks, like Violet and Marigold, just two sisters trying to live their life in the South. And then here comes trying somebody. Not to get pregnant. Right. <laughs> trying not to get pregnant, but that guy was so cute <laughs> and so fine. You know, just trying to work a job and walking home from work and a white man accost her. So these are just ordinary women, ordinary people in a story. But the, the things that happen to them have larger implications. Um, the, the story kind of goes beyond those characters. That's what I try and write. Well, let's open it up to questions. If anyone has any questions, we got some answers. Yes, sir. I have Kick a question. Um, I've not read anywhere you run yet. Yet I'll, I will read it. In all her little secrets, uh, there were some plot twists and turns that I was not expecting, but it really held together. Did you know from when you wrote the first page how that book was going to go, or did it, or did it no. take the twists and turns as you wrote? No, I don't. And, and I've come to discover, I, I did not. I've come to discover now, I'm, I'm working on my fourth book um, right now, that if I'm not surprised, then the reader probably isn't going to be surprised. And so, for example, the way that book ended, I, I always start my books and I never know how they're going to end. I have some general idea of who the bad guys might be in the book, um, but I don't know exactly how. And so with that, I, um, after I got my agent and she gave me notes and she said, you know, 
I think the ending of this book needs to be reworked. I've seen this ending a lot of times before. And I looked at it and I was like, yeah, she's probably right. That's probably been overdone. So I had to scrap that ending and then I had to come up with a different ending. And I'm sitting at home one day and I'm like, I'm never gonna figure this out. And I looked out the window and I thought, oh, wait a minute. Oh yeah, there's that thing. Let me go back and do that. And so I had to drop a few more clues at the beginning to make the end work. But, but yeah, that ending scared me because she's running through that office and I'm like, girl, where you going? <laughs> she is running and I'm like, Whoa, where are we going? What are we doing? She hides under a desk. I'm like, okay, now what are we going to do? Like, you can't stay under here. So I find that, um, if there's a twist and a turn, like I'm working on my fourth book and something came to me the other day and I thought, oh, oh, shoot. And not that I think I'm such a great writer, but I'm like, oh, that would scare me or that would make me cry. And I think, yeah, I got to do that. And, and it's often those times that people say, oh, yeah, when you did X, Y, and T, Z to such and such, that made me cry. I'm like, yeah, that made me cry too. <laughs> Not really a question, but a comment. Um, you hit it on the, the nail on the head with the superpower. I'm not a thriller reader. Never have been. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll try and I just don't like reading about the dead bodies. The sunset, you know, it's not the killer. But when the first book came out, and I kept hearing about it, hearing about it, hearing about it, and I said, no, it's not my thing. I read historical fiction and rock poem. <laughs> and I kept hearing about it, hearing about it. So finally, I said, she's a local author. I may not read it, but I'll buy it because she's a local author. Thank you. So I bought it, <laughs> and I put it on the shelf, and then I kept hearing about it. And then finally one day I said, okay, I'm going to read it. One chapter, guys. That was it. I wouldn't get up till I finished. <laughs> and I said, now she's one of the few authors that's an automatic buy. I don't even have to read a blurb or a review. And I got the next one on pub day. And I can't wait for the third one and learn about the Bella community because you do yeah. learn so much. Yeah. And in the second one, you hit on my historical fiction. That's what I like to read. Thank so, you so much for that. Automatic. You're an automatic buy. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. You had me at the first line on that first. <laughs> <laughs> to add to what my husband said, your first book, well, it's a good choice. All her little secrets. All her little secrets. Yeah. That was the ATL Reads book club book one month. And that's when awesome. he read it. It's an online book club. Yeah, I've heard through of Through the library. Yeah, oh, nice. Yeah, so. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. So as a reader, I found lately, and I was telling my sister-in-law, that I've been struggling <laughs> to read any, any kind of trauma. Mm -hmm. reading, reading, reading a trauma. I'm like, oh, I can't. I'm str I am struggle to get through it. And so I'm curious for both of you as authors, when you're researching or the, the idea comes to mind and then you sit down and you have to write the murder or write the lynching, write the, the attack, how do you navigate from an emotional standpoint the trauma how do, and, and or care for yourselves as you're writing? Mm -hmm. You know, that might help me question. to get through it as I'm reading. You want to go first? Well, I mean, the thing is, it's a tricky thing because on the one hand, I do, I have, I do resist trauma in my writing in that I think too often the black experience is understood as a reaction to trauma. I even find like even in like I have a novel called Silver Sparrow about Two sisters, they have the same dad, only one knows. Secret, you know, it's a bigamy situation. He's got a secret family. And someone wrote about it. These, and it's set in 1980s in Southwest Atlanta, over by to Greenbrier. Someone wrote in a review that these, this family are living in the long tail of slavery. I mean, I guess, but... It's said in the 80s, but that understanding of who we are is like everything, all roads lead back to slavery. And I suppose on some level, perhaps they do, but something set in the 
80s. So I, I've always been kind of like really deliberate about allowing my about my characters doing happy things, doing mundane things, you know, just going to Red Lobster. Like everything doesn't have to, I felt like that in a way is my resistance. But at the same time, like when I wrote um, a book called An American Marriage about a man who was wrongfully convicted, when it came time to end it, I wanted to end it with a hopeful ending, but I was also worried that if I ended it too hopeful, it'd be like I was saying that wrongful conviction is not serious. Like if, if, if the story is serious enough, the topic is serious enough for me to anchor a book around it, I have to accept that there are indelible consequences. So for me, it's kind of a balancing thing, but I always ask myself about the characters when they're having trauma, one, if they weren't having this trauma today, what would they be doing? To just remind myself that that, tr and in my writing, that it was something that wasn't supposed to happen today. And the thing that was supposed to happen today is evidence of a full life. So it's like, into what life did this trouble come? Because a good novel is going to be about people and their problems, not problems and their people. But as far as the way you care for yourself when you write something really traumatic, like I have a scene in the book I'm working on now where a child is assaulted. I wrote some of it and I kind of broke my own heart and I didn't write anymore for about a week. You are allowed to walk away from it and come back. And I also do not prioritize art over my own self care. I'm not a person to say that, well, it's important that this story gets out there, even if it is undermining my peace in a significant way. I am more important than any book. And so I have had books that I just stopped writing. I was like, oh, maybe I'm not doing this. And that is okay. You are not required to traumatize yourself for a story. So for me, um, it's a little bit of, of what she says. I, um, I try to have a balancing act because I write crime fiction. So my book's always going to have some bad stuff in it. I mean, I just... One of these days I'll write a rom-com. I, I, I'm just not there yet. <laughs> but because I know my books are going to have some bad stuff, somebody's going to get killed, somebody's going to you know, be assaulted or something, I try to make sure that my characters speak to larger issues. So it's not just about the, the trauma. Because in my first book, All Her Little Secrets, the protagonist of that book has a very traumatic past. But what I tried to do in balancing that is to make sure that I gave her a, a fuller life, that it just wasn't centered around her trauma, that she either took something from that trauma and she did something with it, or the people that surround her love her and care for her through her trauma. And so I try to make sure that there's some balance around whatever the traumatic event is. And then to speak to um, how do you care for yourself, I, um, I, I'm working, like I said, on my fourth book now, and I've written some scenes where I just put it away after I wrote them, and then I go watch some cartoons or something. Like, literally, you have to, to step away. Um, and it also gives me an opportunity not only to cleanse kind of my brain from that, but also to, to look at the larger picture and say, am I doing this scene correctly? Am I doing justice to this issue that I'm trying to cover um, in this book? And so, you know, to, to, to Yari's point, you kind of have to step away. And it's always good to have at least one funny, funny person in every book. Oh my gosh, yeah. I always have funny people in my books. I mean, I don't know that I'm necessarily funny, but I think about like uncles and aunts and cousins and girlfriends who are funny. And so, you know, people say stuff and you're like, oh, I'm gonna put that in a book. I, I, I just know I'm going to put that in a book. And so, you know, and in where you run, there's just, it's populated with all these characters and all of them have something going on. You know, this bank robber, again, talk about balancing. He's a homeless man, but I made sure that the community around him protected him. And so it's not just this trauma and it's dumped on him, but you know, he's funny too. 
Um, so yeah. I do feel if something funny doesn't happen, then you haven't captured the whole range of human experience. So I kind of, sometimes in my mind, also have an emotional checklist to make sure there's a range of things mm -hmm. that happen. Funny, something touching. Yeah. I mean, even Beloved is a little bit funny. It's a little bit funny. Now you're thinking, I don't remember any funny parts. No, that's a little bit funny. Beloved, have you read it lately? Well, you need to hurry up and read it because you know it's getting banned left and right. So um, <laughs> catch it while you can. But it has some little funny moments. Toni Morrison is really funny. She's real, really funny. And that's how I think she tempers that with all those. She has a lot of wise cracking characters in there. Yes, sir. I walked in. I'm in support of my fiance and sister. I never heard of these two books right here. And I heard that they are standalones, correct? Yes. But my fiance was like, I should read all her little secrets first. And then there were, I guess, a couple parts in Anywhere You Run where it's like, oh, that was from Little Secrets. How do you get the book to kind of correlate, but be separate? You know, it's so funny. That was all kind of happenstance because I wrote all her little secrets and my editor was like, oh, everybody loves that book. So you got to write all her little secrets part two. And I was like, Eh, I don't really want to do that. We just came through this election and we got all of this going on in the world. Can I do something like that? Um, and so that's why I went historical, totally different. But I loved that small town that's in both books, Chillicothe, which is a fabricated town. It's a fictional town in Georgia, Chillicothe, Georgia. Um, and I kind of came up with that because there's a Chillicothe, Ohio, and I'm originally from Ohio, so I was trying to do something cute. Anyway, um, <laughs> it is not totally new, uh, but but the reason why I did that is because I really did love that town, and I loved the way the people in that town embraced each other, and they loved and they they served as like a soft place for other people to land. And so I was like, yeah, I need to, to bring this back. And so that's kind of the little Easter egg. But you don't have to read one before the other. You could read them in either order. It should definitely be a TV series or something. <laughs> well, the first one will be. Um, so fingers crossed for the, the second one. Um, yes. Uh, so what you leave behind. Um, this is in totally different small town, but um, a young woman, uh, Dina Wood, has uh, suffered what I call a grand slam of, of disaster in her life. Uh, she's lost her job, she's gotten a divorce, and she's lost her mom. And, and she and her mom were very, very close. And so she returns back home to Brunswick, Georgia um, from Atlanta. She was living in Atlanta um, and she returns home um, to kind of heal. But that comes with some challenges um, because her father has remarried six months after his wife's death. And um, she finds herself... <laughs> the, the mother's best friend. Yeah. Y'all, my, my books are messy, okay? That's the other thing. I got bodies in my books, but my books are messy too. So yeah, he married the wife's best friend. Um, and so, and, and she has no place to live. So now she's living up in the house with her father and his new wife, who happens to be her mother's best friend. How old is she? Uh, she is 39. Uh, yeah. And so. <laughs> How come she got a divorce? Uh, because he cheated on her and kicked her out of the house. And he kicked her out of the house. No. But, but he refused to get anything in her name so he could kick her out of the house. I'm telling you, my books are messy, okay? But I like a little bit of mess, right? Do I say TikTok? <laughs> so she returns home. She returns home and to deal kind of with all this that's going on in her life, she just goes out driving, just goes out to clear her head. One day she winds up on, um, some very expensive oceanfront property. And she finds um, this older gentleman living out on this property in a trailer, just him and his dog. 
and for some reason she can't get him off her mind. Uh, he runs her off the property. She goes back a few days later. The man is gone, trail is gone, and the property is up for sale. And she wonders, what is going on with this? Um, and so she starts snooping around, and um, what she uncovers is a political scheme of illegal land grabs. And it deals with uh, a legal theory called heirs' property. I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but if you do not have a will or some um, advice on how you want your property disposed of after you die, then everyone that you are related to inherits a fractional share of your property. And all it takes is one relative to sell their fractional share and they can force a partition sale and your property can be sold right from under you. Even if you've lived on that property, you pay taxes on that property. Um, and so she finds out that um, some unsavory uh, people are using this law to their- To kill people? <laughs> well, but again, um, in the midst of all of this, and we talk about balance, you know, there's some dead bodies, of course, um, but, you know, it is really a book about community and coming together as a community and people loving on one another. And stealing their property. <laughs> there you go. Dead bodies and community. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you unravel it? You have a raffle, but I must say, first of all, but please, just one more round of applause for both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I want to, I, I, I failed to, but I want to give a big shout out to Duluth Fine Arts League because they support the library so much and they brought all this food. We didn't do that, they did that. So thank you so much. And for more information about the league, that they do lots in the town, not just support the library, but there's all kinds of crafts and knitting and all kinds of things you can find out. Yeah, all the arts, all the arts. And so you can find out more and please make sure everybody needs to leave here with a cookie. I mean it.